Welcome to Marin Poets Live. I'm Nishama Franklin. I work at the Fairfax Library, and I love poetry. So it's a special pleasure for me to share this opportunity to introduce you to poets from our county in the flesh, as it were, as they read and discuss their work. Monthly tapings will be broadcast on Marin TV and then become a part of a special page on our website, along with biographies of the poets and links to our collection. This is a partnership with the Marin Poetry Center. A common thread throughout the programs will be discovering how living in Marin has influenced their poetry. Those of you who already love poetry will appreciate this direct transmission from the poet to the listener, you. Those who might think of poetry as esoteric or abstract will discover how it can sing when read aloud. For our third program, we feature Doreen Stock. And hello, Doreen. Hi, Nishama. There we are, together on the screen, in the flesh. <laughs> and I, I welcome you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yes. I like to start with a poem right away. Plunge right in. This is a piece of translation from the Russian of Anna Akhmanova. Oh. When I was uh, uh, learning to become a poet, the suggestion was that I translate um, a good poet. And so I began working in her work. And this is a poem about her favorite tree, which was a willow tree, which was emblematic in all of her poetry. And it's called Willow. Yes. I was raised in filigreed silence in the cool nursery of the young century. Human voices were not important to me. I knew the voice of the wind. I loved the asters, the thistles, but most of all, the silver willow, its branches hung in each of my days, its weeping fanned my wakeful nights with dreams. How strange to have outlived it. There, a trunk sticks out, alien voices of other willows saying something under that our sky, and I am silent as if a brother had died. Iya molchu kakbuto mer brat. That is so beautiful. What is the Russian you just said? Uh, the last line, oh, and I, I am silent. Iya molchu mm -hmm. kakbuto mer brat. Right. It's, as if a brother it, had died. There's so much richness in there about speaking of silence through silence. It's, and, and the rhythms are, work so well in English, I bet that was not easy to get. No, because uh, Akhmatova's uh, poetry rhymes, but the Russian language having all of these case endings um, produces rhyme extremely easily, and so I decided to do it without rhyme, oh. preserving everything else about the poem and trying to capture the beautiful voice that she has in her poetry. Mm -hmm. Do you know Russian? I studied Russian in college. Ah, and so you, you did transliteration as well as? I, I translated every word, and then oh. I would take it to the city to a woman who was a, a native speaker, and she would go through the poems with me when I was working on them. That sounds like a wonderful process. It was a wonder. It was very good for my own poetry, and it was good for poetry at large. Mm -hmm. So do you have a poem in your clutch that um, might link you to where we live now? in Marin County. Some do, some don't. And if not, we just know you're here and it feeds you one way or another. Or maybe a poem with a tree in it. Um, I do have a poem that links me to Marin County, and it's a very interesting poem. Um, I lived for many years at Stinson Beach, and I would drive over that mountain road mm -hmm. to Stinson, and it's a whole world. It's a different world. And um, one day when I was driving over the road, a deer jumped on my car and crashed into it. That day was the day that there was a mass killing at, at Virginia Tech. Mm. And those two images collided in my mind and I produced this poem. Wow. And it's called Cho. It begins with a quote by Hannah Arendt from On Violence. We do not know if these occurrences are the beginning of something new, the new example, 
or the death pangs of a faculty that mankind is about to lose. Like the two eyes of the deer that charged my infinity last night on the mountain, not caring that my brights were on from his narrow rock ledge, I was society's mistake, an engine in his path thrown upon him as he crashed against me, somersaulted over me, and stunned, bounced back up, turned, stared at my white car body before crashing down the canyon to lay there this morning, a being expiring from excess, the sacred world dying everywhere around him, only alien blackness because he couldn't see. You were lucky, said Sal behind the desk at the auto body. If he had broken your windshield, he would have panicked and bitten you all up. I've seen this. It's not a pretty sight. And all day in the strange black mobster car from the rental agency, listening to the details from Virginia Tech, wobbling over familiar landscapes, coming unglued from within until sunset, such pain when I pass through the night threshold and sense the new trees springing up along the same mountain road, 34, one for each student and teacher, the 35th their killer. Oh my. CNN interviews the gun salesman, his green plaid shirt tucked in. We ran the check, he maintains, absolving himself from the carnage. Carnage is not a word for a poem, but that's where we are. The flag at half-mast over the large university. And we are Virginia Tech. We will be Virginia Tech, a poet as cheerleader at the graduation ceremony and Cho's relatives in Korea being interviewed about his childhood. Something wrong from the start, they say. That something careening headlong into the classroom, guns blazing, Cho, bam, Cho, bam, Cho. Wow, I'm sorry I interrupted. <laughs> That's okay. But I, it's a wonderful, long, rich poem. And one of the things I love is how quotidian and huge it is all at the same time. You know, the details, the rental car, just, uh, just as a joy to hear that kind of work. Thank you. Would you like to take a little time now to talk about how you start? When did you, when did you know you were a poet? When did I know I was a poet? I had a, my mother forced me to take piano lessons, and I think it was very valuable. I learned how to read notes. But into it, a couple of maybe two years into it, I dreamt that I was playing the piano and it became the keys of a typewriter and beautiful music was coming out of the typewriter. Mm. And so I said to my mom, I think I'm not going to take piano anymore. I dreamt I was playing a song on a typewriter and I was too young to really follow through and mm. know that that was my vocation announcing itself to me, yeah. but it was, and um, I began writing when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. That's, and you never stopped. No. Yeah. But I bet you've done other things in your life as well. Yeah. Yeah, which feeds the poetry. Yeah, that's uh, very exciting. Can you just, no, let's have another poem, then we'll talk about more stuff. Women poets who um, are strong and beautiful and are political as well as um, uh, write about things that are important to women have been hugely influential in my life. Mm. And I'm going to read a second piece of translation here. And this is from the Spanish of Gabriela Mistral. Oh. Uh, Mistral was uh, a Chilean poet, I'm sure many people have heard of her who uh, won the Nobel Prize and was um, a delegate, Chile's, Chile's delegate to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. um, she was a teacher of Pablo Neruda, and um, she actually lived in Santa Barbara for a while. This is from a collection um, that I translated called La Cuenta Mundo, uh, The World Counting, and it's to a newborn baby describing the things of our earth. This is called The House. The table is covered, my son, with the stillness of skin on warm milk, and on four blue walls the ceramics are blinking. 
here's the salt, here's the oil, and in the center, the bread that almost speaks. Gold, more lovely than gold of bread, is not found in fruit or broom plant. And its smell of wheat and oven give us a joy that can never be too much. We break it together, my little son, with pure fingers and soft palms, and you look at it amazed that the black earth can give such a white flower. Put down your hand as it reaches for food, and your mother will put hers down too. The wheat, my son, is of air, of sunlight, and of hoe. But this bread called the face of God does not come to every house's table. And if other children do not have it, it's better, my son, that you not touch it. Better not to take it with ashamed hands. My son, hunger, with his twisted face, circles the piles of wheat in whirlwinds. They search and never find each other, bread and hunchbacked hunger. That he find it should he enter now, let's leave the bread until tomorrow. The blazing fire marks the door, the Quechuan Indian never closes, and we will watch hunger eat to sleep with body and soul. Mm. And again, that starts in such a kind of a visceral, cozy place and spirals out hugely. Yes, it's the, it's the personal and the political all yeah. woven together, and I, I greatly admired it, and right. it's, it's a, been a great Was impact. Mistral her given name? It's such a poetic name. It's, it describes a wind. I know what it means, yeah. but she, she, she took it. She took it. Yeah, good. Yeah, she good. Took it. She lived a simple life, a village life. Yeah. How many languages do you know? <laughs> uh, no is a good way yeah. of putting it because I don't, I'm not fluent in any of them, but I studied Spanish earliest, and that's the one that I'm the most comfortable with, even though I don't have a huge vocabulary. I studied Russian in college, and that's the second uh, one. I studied Hebrew when I lived in, in Israel, and um, I, these are not languages that I have speaking knowledge yeah. of, but when I get into the country again and it starts clicking, um, mm -hmm. I can find my way around. Right, and language is so much fun. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. interesting, beautiful. Another poem, please. This, uh, I'm a swimmer, oh. and um, part of my, my, my process is this swimming. The swimming is the thing that generates, I, I feel, the um, ideas from the depths, and I swim regularly. Um, about 20 laps of an Olympic-sized pool in the morning. And um, this poem was written on 9-11. Mm -hmm. And it's called, I Was Swimming. I swam 20 laps, a measured, even swim. With each breath I took, they were running and dying, diving and dying, flying and dying, drifting through heaven, becoming angels of smoke, leaving their hands here on earth, their legs, hair, eyes, mounting on new gray wings. They changed worlds, exploding as I swam, my eyes open and trying to count the little black tiles at the bottom in the long line that separates me from the man swimming next to me. As they became my own unwitting sacrifice, going in place of me into the emptiness reserved for objects of hate and their radiant tormentors. Their little desks climbed up freed of their papers and their little chairs sailed into nirvana. Someone bound her hands for me, the stewardess I mean, who had to suffer for me on a flight I did not take because I live heedlessly on earth among the heedless. Oh, they flew home from me as I swam 20 laps, and they became stars on the flag of the sky, and the stripes that scream blood and sorrow, blood and sorrow, those 13 long wavy lines. I swam 20 laps, and then floating for a moment on my back, I saw how they loved one another in the black iron stairwells forever. And now 
how they beckon to become love in us all. Mm. That's exquisite. And it's fascinating to me how this has become, this event has permeated our culture. It's become very iconic. All those images work for us. And yet, especially in your poem, there's nothing cliched in there. They, ha they have a freshness that I really appreciate. So indeed, you had seen it on the TV, and you, I, I, have, to, I have to know the backstory, and you <laughs> went swimming as well. You, no, you, I was oh, swimming oh, you before didn't, I knew. No, before you knew. As okay. it was happening. As it was happening, you were swimming, and then you did this incredible went, synthesis. Right, and then I visited okay. my mother, and she had the television on, ah. and boom, I realized what had happened while I was swimming. Yes, yes, because it has a kind of a folded immediacy that you that's what managed it, that's to. That's how I experienced it. Yes, yes. Tell me about your, uh, obviously you have a kind of order, maybe not obviously, an orderly life if you like to swim every morning. <laughs> Do you have a, a, a rhythm to your uh, craft? Do you? A disciplined life. Yes. Um, no, <laughs> actually I don't have a discipline when it comes to poetry because those poems come in the weirdest places and <sighs> they're often scribbled on napkins and um, they're often, so, so I, just the other day I got off the freeway and stopped and had a coffee because there was a poem coming and I knew that if I went home and sat down with all of the distraction, my house has just been flooded from a big rain, there's fans <sighs> going, that I wouldn't get this poem. Mm -hmm. So I went to Max's, sat down ah. and got the poem and then Yes, you have the butterfly home. net of consciousness, yeah, <laughs> always <laughs> ready, ready to catch it. Right, and sometimes I don't catch them. Mm -hmm. and. Um, but I've often recorded dreams that have um, the seed of a poem in them. Right. And well, there's dreams in the, those right. poems all the time. Yeah. That double consciousness. Right. Which is wonderful. And another one, please. Um, a discipline of mine is to try to read the New York Times <laughs> um, most days. And... Um, it generates a great deal of my poetry because of the consciousness of, of world events. And being a woman, I'm always focused on the problem of women in our, in our world. And this poem is emblematic, I feel, of that. It's been widely published. It's for two schoolgirls, Logar Province, Afghanistan. For the red carnations that once were your throats. For the red carnations that opened all at once on your young backs. For the red carnations that flowered through your hearts. For the purple silence of your lips. The amethyst bruises under your eyelids. The dawn-lit tears of the schoolyard little people who watched you fall in the brown wheat and your killers vanish. For the carnations that once were your voices and the jeweled eyes that only wanted to read that chalkboard thick with dust, wordless black space that hangs beyond you, erasing the future of a land called Afghanistan. For the red carnations, all of them, blooming into the shattered oblivion of your shattered smiles. Mm. What astounds me about that poem is that it is, the subject is as grim as you get, and yet I feel that you're carrying those girls in the poem. And there's, a, there's a sacramental quality, and so that's what lifts it above the you know, the terror and the horror and the sadness. And of course, that's the alchemy of poetry. Yes, I think that's the thing that um, if, if we were to just despair mm -hmm. at the things that happen, um, we almost couldn't go on. But grappling with them in, in the poem gives me a sense of paying homage to the suffering and at the same time, um, transforming it in some Yes, way. well, I don't get grapple, I get transformed. So the grapple goes before, <laughs> before. So I would love to hear what else you have. Okay. 
Um, we live in Marin County and we live right near a prison. Oh. And our prison, our local prison, San Quentin, um, was um, the place where I went to demonstrate against um, the death penalty for many cold nights. Mm -hmm. This was one night when my committee from the synagogue that I belong to were all going to this demonstration there. And I, there was such a huge traffic jam on the way to the prison that I turned and uncharacteristically, I went for a night swim instead of a demonstration. <sighs> and this poem comes out of that moment where I didn't go to the demonstration. I went swimming instead, but in my consciousness, that was happening. Redeemed criminal being executed, San Quentin, December 13th, 2005, for Tookie Williams. Let's say you really did kill four people in the haze of gang violence 28 years ago in LA. And as the thousands gather at the prison gates tonight, you are executed by lethal injection in my name, I, I'm the one who didn't come to watch, the one who swam under the night air in the lit and steaming pool, the bright spotlights lining it, and in the dark, where I couldn't see him, the lifeguard sitting above me on his solitary perch, hooded against the December chill, his eyes on me as I breathed in, swam lap after lap in a black swimsuit through the cold night water, me breathing in and out as you did, in and out, breathing in your life and letting it go. They say you waved the presence of clergy, presenting yourself calmly, just you and the poison, like so much water to heave your soul through until it passed between the great lights and the lesser lights and swam its final laps, then dripping and shivering, let your shutting, shuddering body go crossing over my name, the name of any ordinary California citizen that didn't elect this governor or choose this method or sanction this fate for you, redeemed or not, criminal or not, my name scrawled on the petition saying simply, not me, do not kill him because of me, so that in the end, your death had to pass over my name with its dark, ambiguous wing. Tell me something. If I retitled this poem, Woman Drowns While Lifeguard Looks On, would it come any closer to what you actually experienced on this, your last night on earth? Or will you be coming back for more? Mm. Wow. That is amazing. I, I remember those demonstration days. So here we are in Marin um, with injustices galore. They are around us everywhere. And you, Dorina, are going to shine the light on them and transmute them however you can into something that lifts our souls and makes us think. We have about four minutes left. Do you, are you down to your last poems? Um, I mean, in there. terms of what you want for a yeah, last poem. I'm getting there. Um, okay. I have a poem for my mother who uh, died this year. And um, again, I was reading the New York Times and sitting at the um, Taste of Rome when I, I wrote down this uh, quote from an article not knowing that it was going to be about her. On the dumping of pianos. This is the quote. To be honest with you, the guys enjoy it. They try so hard all day not to scratch anything, and all of a sudden, they get to throw it off the truck. The New York Times, July 30th, 2012. So some of them land with their legs in the air, I'm told, although I haven't seen it. Some let out a whole symphony of wailing, bang, 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 as they're tossed, and some get the ax their dark cabinets burned up for firewood. There's a huge metal stove, too, that can demolish them, firebirds of smoke billowing out, I imagine, Sviatoslav Richters of heat, melting their keys, curling their strings. Thus, I wanted my mother's body watched.